For one reason or another, people take an amazing number of chances. Some of us seem to get a thrill out of it. But more often than not, we get ourselves into dangerous situations through carelessness or thoughtlessness. Usually we think to ourselves, nothing is going to happen to me. Some people may have to pay the piper, but I'm not one of them. Back in the days when the fringe top Surrey was the latest thing in transportation, this penchant for chance taking was less of a hazard simply because there were fewer opportunities to take chances. Even when the Surrey owner traded in old Dobbin on a one-cylinder engine, our latent risk-taking characteristics had little opportunity for expression. Fifteen miles per hour was a dangerous speed, and the horseless carriage was approached with awe and trepidation by anyone who aspired to operate. But swifter models appeared, and soon the local daredevil was speeding recklessly at about a half a mile a minute, and everybody was driving at 15 and 20 without giving it a thought. And so it went until in the 1930s, father could drive at 50 and 60, and mother wouldn't criticize, that is, unless she happened to glance at the speedometer. Along with the speed and comfort it had brought us, the machine age had also made it easier for us to take chances. Like the automobile, the airplane is essentially a safe and dependable mechanism, provided it is operated by a thoroughly competent pilot who knows and respects the airplane's limitations as well as his own. But it's even easier to take risks with an airplane, whether deliberately or through carelessness. The odds against the chance taker are greater, and the penalties more severe. To protect the naval aviator against this human tendency toward chance taking and carelessness, the Navy has established quite a number of routines and regulations, including such items as the pre-flight inspection and testing procedure, which you have already seen. Of equal importance with these is the daily flight inspection form. Every day before the first flight, the plane captain inspects his plane according to the inspection form, checking each item as he inspects it. But you say this inspection, which is carried out by the plane captain, is the same as a pre-flight inspection the pilot is supposed to make. Right. But that is one of those safety precautions whereby the Navy endeavors to make flying more safe for you. You and the plane captain are both human. He might miss something. You might miss something. So you both inspect and test the plane. Also, you are the one who will be up there in the airplane, not the plane captain. So you'll want to make your own inspection anyway. When the plane captain has completed his inspection, he signs the report form, certifying that the airplane is ready for flight. During the day, each pilot to whom that plane is assigned glances over the form to see that all items have been checked and that the plane captain has signed the form. Next, he glances down at the section of the form on which each pilot reports the condition of his plane after flight. If no defects have been found in the plane during flight, the previous pilot will have written OK, followed by his signature. If some defect has been found, it will be noted. If the difficulty has been corrected, this statement will be followed by the OK and signature of the person authorized to approve the plane for flight. If the plane has been subjected to any unusual stress or strain during flight, Bureau regulations specify that this also must be reported, both in writing on the form and verbally to the squadron duty officer. However, if previous pilots have reported the plane OK, or if all defects have been corrected and OK, then the pilot signs in this space, indicating that he has inspected and tested the plane, and that he accepts it for flight. In the case of a dual hop, including both student and instructor, the instructor signs the report form. When a student is going up for a solo hop, he signs the form. Can you hear me all right? Better put your goggles down. Always adjust them before leaving the line. Dust in your eyes at the wrong moment can get you into trouble. And of course, flying regularly without goggles can injure your eyes permanently. Also, right from the beginning, get 
used to glancing at the tower before you leave the line to find out the direction and approximate strength of the wind and the number of the course on which you're to take off. Also, look at the course flag to find out the direction of traffic around the field and whether or not you're clear to leave the line. We give the plane captain the thumbs up signal to remove the shocks and hold the brakes while he does it. As soon as you're airborne, you can forget for the time being everything we've said about handling the plane on the ground. On the ground, the wings simply went along for the ride. But in the air, the wings are the airplane. All the rest merely goes along to help them. Since basically the airplane is no more and no less than a flying wing, let's attempt to find out what we can expect from the wing from the standpoint of performance. First of all, granted proper design, we know the wing will fly. Of course, unless our wing is to be a glider, we'd have to have power to pull it through the air. But here, for purposes of simplification, we do not show the engine. With certain limitations, we know that when we tilt the wing up, it wants to go up. When we tilt the wing down, it wants to come down. But how do we turn it? We turn it by lowering one end of the wing and raising the other end. We bank the wing to the right for a right turn, to the left for a left turn. No matter what you may have thought in the past, the only correct way to turn the wing is by banking it. But in order to conveniently fly the wing, we need certain controls which will make it assume the attitudes we have just demonstrated. For example, suppose we put movable control surfaces on the trailing edge of each side of the wing. These we call ailerons. If we put the right aileron up, that will make the right end of the wing want to go down. And if at the same time we put the left aileron down, that will make the left end of the wing want to go up. Thus we put the wing into a right bank, which as we have seen will make it turn to the right. If the bank is shallow, you get a slow rate of turn. Steepen up the bank and the turn becomes sharper. So the amount you bank the wing determines the sharpness of your turn. But here's an odd situation. We use the ailerons to bank the plane. But once the bank is established, we don't need them anymore. If we let them come back to neutral, the wing remains in the same degree of bank and turn until we apply the ailerons the other way to bring it out of the turn. An easy way to control the tilt of the wing to make it want to go up or down 
is to add other control surfaces back here. These are called elevators. If we tilt them this way, the air forces the tail down, and that in turn tilts the wing up. If we tilt the elevators this way, the air will force the tail up, and that in turn tilts the wing down. But the elevators are usually attached to the wing by a fuselage. Also, the tail assembly is not complete without the addition of the rudder, the most misunderstood control on the airplane. The use of the rudder will be demonstrated later. Now, put an engine on our wing and we have an airplane, which is no different in its basic essentials from the primary trainer. Except the chances are your primary trainer will be a biplane having two wings instead of one. We've already seen how the various control surfaces affect the attitude of the airplane. Now let's look at it from the pilot's viewpoint. We pull the stick back. That tilts the wings up, bringing the nose of the plane toward the pilot. If we push the stick forward, that tilts the wings down, pushing the nose away from the pilot. If we put the stick over to the right, that banks the plane to the right, pushing the right wing away from the pilot and bringing the left wing toward it. If we put the stick over to the left, it banks the airplane to the left, pushing the left wing away from the pilot and bringing the right wing toward him. When you move the stick forward and back, you operate only the elevators. When you move it from side to side, you operate only the ailerons. But you can also operate both at once in countless combinations. For instance, if you want to push the nose and the right wing away from you at the same time, you do this. Then if you want to bring the nose and the wing back toward you, you do this. And remember that the effect of the controls in relation to you is the same, regardless of the attitude of the airplane. In a glide, if you pull back on the stick, the nose will come toward you. In a turn, exactly the same thing is true. Pull back on the stick and the nose comes toward you. Turn the plane upside down. Pull the stick back and you're still pulling the nose toward you. Push the stick away from you and you push the nose away from you. Push the stick over to the right and you push the right wing away from you and pull the left wing toward you, regardless of whether your plane is upside down or right side up or vertical. You are the center of things. All controls operate in relation to you, regardless of the attitude of the airplane.